Psychoanalysis in the Soviet Union by Wilhelm Reich. It is impossible to speak of a psychoanalytic movement existing in the Soviet Union as it exists in Western Europe and the United States. There does exist in Moscow a society which is concerned with the theories of psychoanalysis and under whose auspices regular meetings of a high scientific level are held. But there are very few doctors who practice the psychoanalytical method. The first impression one gets in the Soviet Union is one of outright rejection. It is true that in 1925, on the occasion of a discussion on the problem of sex, the People's Commissar for Health, Samashko, spoke of the unconscious and publicly supported the theory of sublimation. But many influential public personalities are against psychoanalysis while others, such as Bukharin and Radek, are interested in it without, go or without doing a great deal to defend it. From time to time, lively discussions take place on the question whether psychoanalysis should or should not be recognized. Its opponents reject it on the grounds that it is an idealist science. It is said that in the years 1922 and 1923, Soviet communist youth were strongly interested in psychoanalysis. The party then intervened because discussions on psychoanalysis interfered with political work. Does all this mean that there is no room for psychoanalysis in the workers and peasants state? Is psychoanalysis rejected there as a matter of principle, as for instance, it is rejected by official science and the bourgeois countries? The first impression certainly suggests that this is so. But if we go beyond superficial opinions and declarations, if we seriously try to discuss and analyze the nature of this rejection, if, in particular, we take the trouble to study Marx, Lenin, and the history of the Russian Revolution, we shall find that the attitude towards psychoanalysis in the Soviet Union has a very special character. In essence, it can be understood only within the context of the overall structure of Soviet Russia on the one hand, and of the general world situation of psychoanalysis on the other. In order to understand the position of psychoanalysis in the Soviet Union, we must ask, what is it in psychoanalysis that is rejected and why? To answer these questions, we must briefly describe the present situation in the Soviet Union. Union. March 1917, marked the overthrow of Tsarism, and October of the same year, that of bourgeois government. The councils of workers and peasants seized all power. The revolution was led by the Bolsheviks, old, orthodox, well-trained Marxists, with Lenin at their head. Marxism, the doctrine of laws governing social history, was not only the theory which, in its consistent and practical application by Lenin, led the revolution to victory, after the revolution, it became the official and solely recognized pattern for the reshaping of society in accordance with planned economic ideas. Because Marxism had acted so powerfully as a lever of social revolution, it is understandable that proletarian leaders today want to preserve it from any contamination by other theories and doctrines. They want to keep Marxism pure. But Marxism is more than a social theory. It is, at the same time, a philosophic method of thinking in general. In Marxist social theory is the result of the application of dialectical materialism to human society. Since, moreover, its findings correspond to the class interests of the proletariat rather than those of the bourgeoisie, its method of thinking has become the world philosophy of the class-conscious proletariat. Thus, Marxist political, economic, and social theory, the Marxist method, and the Marxist worldview form a unified system, but a system which, unlike others, never becomes rigid, but as a result of its dialectical method, is always dynamic within itself, always mobile, and it adapted to the constant movement and change taking place in nature and society. It is a system which does not admit of a psychological explanation of social history or even of social phenomena, because a psychological explanation of, say, capitalism must of necessity be abstract and idealist, 
since it replaces the economic motive forces of social history by psychological ones, and more particularly as they appear in single individuals. Hence, any psychological explanation of history is inevitably, and without any possibility of compromise, in conflict with Marx's materialist interpretation of history, which teaches that the individual's will and actions, so far as their concrete content is concerned, must be seen only as products of a given social structure, and not vice versa. Yet Marx himself stated explicitly that men, not as individuals, but as a collective, make their own history, albeit only under given and requisite economic, economic conditions. Anyone who, for example, views the history of France at the turn of the 18th century as a result of Napoleon's personality, or tries to explain the World War of 1914 to 1918 in terms of the megalomania and greed for power of Wilhelm II, is sharply contradicting the teachings of historical materialism because he is trying to replace a materialist method of thinking with an idealist one. From the historical materialist point of view, the individual of genius is only the executive organ of social trends. From the bourgeois idealist point of view, he is the very driving force of history. The former view is sociological materialist, the latter psychological idealist. Let us now briefly consider the political and economic situation of the Soviet Union today. The process of social transformation began after the October Revolution with an economy shattered by the World War. During this process of transformation, Russia was not only isolated, but actually had to fight for her very life against the intervention of the capitalist powers and the white armies in a civil war lasting three years, 1919 to 1922. As a result, production dropped catastrophically, and the period of economic reconstruction began only after the victorious conclusion of the Civil War. By 1927, in the most important branches of the economy, the pre-war level of production had already been exceeded. In 1928, a plan of the Supreme People's Economic Soviet, the five-year plan, came into force. The central object of this plan is to free the Soviet Union from economic encirclement, i.e. to transform the economy within five years in such a way that the Soviet Union will become entirely independent of other countries. Industrial production is to be many times greater than pre-war production, and agriculture is to be industrialized. The fulfillment of the five-year plan, which is to bring the Soviet Union into line with the modern capitalist countries, and which, judging by the results of the first year of the plan 1928 to 1929, will achieve its purpose unless a war intervenes, demands the straining of Russia's available forces to the very limit. The hostility of the surrounding countries requires the strictest discipline within, but that is not the only thing that matters. It is also important to preserve and rigorously apply the scientific method with whose help alone, as the communists see it, the construction of socialism can be achieved. It is not so much that the Russians have no time to discuss a modern psychology, which also claims to have something to say on the subject of social development. Rather, they see no necess necessity for it. And indeed, certain experiences have taught the Russian Marxists that the psychological interpretation of social problems carries reactionary dangers within it. And so the science as a whole is rejected, even though it contains only the germ of a threat to the success of the great cause. It might be argued that psychoanalysis does not make claims such as I have described, that it is content to be a psychological method or system, as the founder of psychoanalysis himself has emphasized. But the situation is not as simple as that. Psychoanalysis, as represented by many of its spokesmen, has gone beyond its specific sphere, and the statements and actions of these spokesmen have gone unchall unchallenged within the psychoanalytic world. The Russians, who are forced to struggle incessantly against a world of enemies in order to secure and complete the success of their revolution, are not inclined to treat such matters lightly. They take the they take psychoanalysis seriously, not only as a modern science, but also because the bourgeoisie likes to play it off against Marxism. 
Attempts are not lacking in the bourgeois countries to psychologize the science of sociology. For example, Hendrik de Man, a former Marxist, attacks Marxism with badly understood psychoanalytical terms in his book, The Psychology of Socialism. And even certain representatives of psychoanalysis itself have repeatedly attempted a psychoanalytic explanation of sociological facts and phenomena. Thus, for instance, Kolnai, who for a time was considered to be a psychoanalyst, explains the communist revolution and communism in general in terms of a neurotic regression to the mother. In other, in other quarters, the German revolution of 1918 has been interpreted as a rising of sons against their father, the Kaiser, and so forth. The discussion following a lecture on psychoanalysis as a natural science, which I delivered at the Communist Academy in Moscow last September, made it clear that the Russians have nothing against psych psychoanalysis as a psychological discipline, but are opposed only to so-called Freudism, by which they mean a psychoanalytical view of the world. This distinction is important. For the reasons described, totem and taboo, insofar as it explains the origins of culture in terms of the Oedipus complex, and group psychology in the, in the analysis of the ego, are rejected as un-Marxist, idealist works. On the other hand, Sapir, an official spokesman of the Academy, has explicitly referred to the theories of the unconscious, of repression, infantile sexuality, etc., as important and valuable. People in Russia talk a great deal about periclutiony, that is to say, conversion of sexual energy into work. Freud's theory of sublimation is fully recognized. The campaign against psychoanalysis is often the result of methodological confusion on the part of the Marxists, e.g. when they accuse psychoanalysis of being an individualist psychology unconcerned with, the social, with social psychology. The obvious answer to such an accusation is that any form of psychology can only, of necessity, be psychology of the individual. Social phenomena such as class consciousness, the will to strike, etc., are not accessible to it. But the critics of psychoanalysis, when they make this charge, often mean that it leaves out of account the, the class situation of the individual. Another approach is that psychoanalytic theory overemphasizes the biological aspect of personality to the detriment of the social aspect. As a result, social performance, for instance, creative or productive work, is ascribed entirely to instinct. This objection is based on the argument that no attempt has so far been made by psych psychologists to define the influence of social factors as against that of biological factors. And it is true that in psychoanalytical literature, one encounters attitudes which suggest that instinct, independent of any molding influences from the outside world, is all that matters. Yet this view does not form part of Freudian psychology, which states very clearly that psychological development is due to the molding of instincts by influences from the outside world. Even the Oedipus relationship is not a biological, but a social phenomenon determined by the patriarchal structure of the family. Surely neither the Marxist nor the psychoanalyst can have any objection to the view that psychological development results from the conflict between individual needs and social limitations, which also includes the conflicts of the Oedipus age. Another area of controversy concerns the respective spheres of competence in the explanation of ideologies. For instance, should religion be explained sociologically or psychologically? The Marxist says, religion is a social phenomenon whose origins are demonstrably to be found in concrete conditions of production. The Freudian maintains that religion can be explained by the child's attitude to its father, the idea of God is unequivocally a father idea, and analogies can be found between religious dogma and certain compulsive notions. On this point, there exists practically no possibility of compromise, but only of methodological clarification. Psychoanalysis cannot do more than explain how and by what motives a child absorbs those religious concepts and ideas which it finds in a certain form in its environment. 
It cannot explain why a particular religion arises and gains ground as a social phenomenon in a, in a, in a particular historical period. And psychoanalysis has never claimed to be able to explain religion as a whole. Where, however, the majority of individuals in the same social situation practice similar rights, psychoanalysis can uncover the meaning of those rights as it appears typically among all those who practice them. Undoubtedly, Marxism alone is capable of showing why the Jewish religion is different in character from the Christian, and these, again, from the Buddhist. It can find connections with the social and economic mode of existence of the Jews or Christians or Indians to explain the specific nature of each religion. Likewise, psychoanalysis cannot explain the disappearance of religion under socialism or the phenomenon of the religious inquisition in the Middle Ages unless it applies Marxist viewpoints when interpreting these phenomena. But in that case, it is no longer functioning purely as a theory of psychology. The handling of the problem of symbolism by some authors, which even from the purely psychoanalytical point of view is incorrect or at least extremely one-sided, has done much harm to the cause of psychoanalysis in Soviet Russia. For instance, certain psychoanalytical writings on the agriculture of primitive races convey the impression that land cultivation is only a symbolic action and nothing more. Symbolic speculations of this kind must discredit psychoanalysis in the eyes of even the most well-disposed Marxist, for the outsider cannot be expected to distinguish between psychoanalysis and pseudo-psychoanalysis. Marxist thinking, being absolutely materialist-oriented, resists not symbolism as such, but its misuse. But then, so does the thinking of a clinical psychoanalyst. Every object and every activity has its rational meaning. It may become a symbol, but does not by any means have to become one. Objects and activities owe their existence not to their symbolic meaning, but to their value as utility articles or commodities or in the case of activities as productive work. Airplanes and railways are not made because they are symbols of instinctual ideas, but because certain production conditions lead to their being invented and made. What goes on in the designer's unconscious as he designs them is of importance only if he comes to us as a patient. If, and even if the airplane he has invented has some phallic significance for him, that does not mean that the symbol was the motive for making the airplane. In the 5th century, when phallic ideas were no different from what they are today, the same man could certainly not have designed an airplane. We have to admit that, the, that this argument, often advanced by Marxists, is objectively faultless. This is not the place to show in detail that such cases, cases where psychoanalysis goes beyond its proper sphere and is methodologically misapplied, do occasionally take place, leading to completely mistaken views concerning the real nature of psychoanalysis among orthodox Marxists. When once in a while psychoanalysis is correctly represented, Marxists refuse to recognize it as Freudian. In a paper entitled Dialectical Materialism and Psychoanalysis, I tried to set out the fundamental principles of psychoanalytic theory, placing the emphasis on purely Freudian, that is to say, clinical, psychoanalysis. The editorial board of the Moscow Journal, Pod Znamen <laughs> Marxisma, where the Russian text of this paper was published, felt itself obliged to add an editorial note to the effect that it did not agree with my account of psychoanalysis. And two communists expressed the view that what I said in my article was very convincing, but was not Freudian psychoanalysis as they knew it. This means two things. First, that the development of psychoanalytic theory over the last few years has blurred the pure, empirical, and scientifically unassailable features of psychoanalysis so that today we can almost speak of two kinds of psychoanalysis. Second, that the Marxists have no objection to scientific psychoanalysis. In the article by Sapir, published in Reply to Mine, the theories of the unconscious, of repression, of the instincts, and other cardinal elements of psychoanalysis are recognized. Sapir's attacks are directed in part against theses which psychoanalysis has never advanced, 
and in part against excessive claims of competence, such as we have described in my various psychological interpretations of social processes. My overall impression in Moscow was that the Marxist theoreticians will accept psychoanalysis if they are presented with its pure scientific core, i.e. the materialist dialectical foundations of psychoanalysis. And if a clear division is drawn between these and various idealist theories and applications of psychoanalysis, of psychoanalysis. Here's the difference between the position of psychoanalysis in bourgeois countries and in the Soviet Union. In Germany and America, psychoanalysis only began to be recognized when it became non-materialist, that is to say, idealist, in some of its most important aspects deviation from the theory of the libido, emergence of the death wish theory, the incoherent, in my opinion, application of psychology, psychology to sociology and cultural history, etc. In the Soviet Union, it is precisely these aspects of psychoanalysis which are, which are objected to. While the core aspects, while the core of psychoanalytic theory could readily be accepted, Jernitz, in his critique of psychoanalytic theory, actually speaks of a decay of original scientific psychoanalysis. I must add that many Marxists, partly because their knowledge of psychoanalysis is poor, and partly for reasons of personal resistance, show a lack of objectivity in their criticisms. To some extent, these criticisms come from medical men of the older generation who can neither think in psychological terms nor are trained in methodology. Their uninformed attitude is greatly confirmed by the lack of unity on theoretical issues among psychoanalysts today. The true Marxist, however, is so objectively oriented by his general attitude to life and society, he is so immune from every form of mysticism or idealist thought, that the plain facts about psychoanalysts, psycho analysis are bound to achieve recognition in the end. Salkind, trying to attack my lecture at, at the Communist Academy, could finally find nothing more to say than that I had taken a very diplomatic line. I had spoken about psychoanalysis as a science, but not about so-called Freud Freudism. In my final contribution, I was able to quote Freud himself, who has spoken against the interpretation of psych psychoanalysis as a world philosophy, i.e. implicitly against the so-called Freudism attacked by the Marxists. For the Marxist, a theory is of great interest only if it, is, it also has practical significance. The question has been asked again and again, what is the practical significance of psychoanalysis analysis for socialism? The first answer is obviously psychotherapy, but all psychoanalysts must surely be agreed that psychoanalysis cannot be a mass therapy, and by reason of its nature can never become one. True, at Professor Rosenstein's Neuropsychological Institute in Moscow, psychoanalytical therapy is practiced among other methods. Dr. Friedman, a member of the Moscow Psychoanalytical Society, is the Institute's official psychoanalyst. Psychoanalysis is used there side by side with other forms of therapy. Dr. Rosenstein showed us the psychotherapy room where a picture of Freud hangs on the wall. We were also able to note with satisfaction that many young doctors, both at the Venerological Dispensary and in Psychoneurological Institute, have an attitude of complete understanding and appreciation vis-a-vis -vis psychoanalysis and apply it in practice when assessing cases. Professor Rosenstein, the chief of the institute, is a declared friend of psycho psychoanalysis, but the main practical importance of psychoanalysis does not reside in therapy. It is characteristic of Soviet medicine as a whole that it is paying more and more attention to mass prophylaxis. Extensive and interesting statistical and other research is being carried out at all institutes with a view to developing this field of study. Some statistics concerning the sexual life of the masses have already been obtained. The questions being formulated in a manner which could not even be dreamt of in Western countries, 
where they would be considered shocking. It must be emphasized that this work is being done by official bodies and not privately. Hence, the interest in prophylaxis of neuroses is very great, and concrete questions are being addressed to psychoanalysis in connection with this subject. Intensive collaboration with Russian institutes is urgently needed in this field. In our countries, because of the concentration on individual therapy, the question of prophylaxis has not yet been broached. The statement that only a theory of neuroses, which proceeds by causal investigation, can furnish the fundamentals of prophylaxis of neuroses was received with great attention, but con concrete results are still awaited. At the Venerological Dispensary, Director Dr. Badkiss, Great, great interest was also shown in the practical application of psychoanalysis at the Sexual Advice Bureau for Industrial and Office Workers in Vienna. At the Marx-Lenin Institute in Kharkov, psychoanalytical research is being carried out, but owing to lack of personal contact, it cannot say anything about its value or content. The fact, however, that in response to my sending in a psychoanalytic paper, the Institute invited me to continue as its regular contributor on psychoanalysis and appointing me a corresponding member shows considerable active interest. In contrast, confusion reigns in matters of sexual psychology. In this respect, we were unable to note any difference from conditions in Western Europe. It should be mentioned here that the children's home run by the psychoanalyst Vera Schmidt was not officially banned, as was reported in the West. The director of the home closed it down herself because, as she personally told me, she realized that the requisite conditions for that, that type of work were not yet available. It has also been rumored, rumored here that Freud's The Future of an Illusion was banned in Soviet Russia. In this field, as in many others, I have found that political animosity toward the workers' state, particularly on the part of Russian emigres of more or less white persuasion, has led to the dissemination of conscious untruths. Freud's book on religion has not only has not only not been banned, but was actually translated into Russian in 1928. The Psychoanalytical Association in Moscow has decided to send Professor Freud a copy of the translation as concrete proof of the fact that the report is untrue. All in all, the contradictory impressions of the tour led to the conclusion that psychoanalysis in its pure empirical form will eventually be accepted as a theory of psychology, but only on the condition that it is freed from all idealist and extraclinical exc excrescences. Such acceptance, however, and this emerges clearly from the overall structure of the Soviet Union, will not remain a private one, but will become official once the economic pressure has slackened. The hostile encircle encirclement by capitalist countries has ended and the leaders of the socialist state become aware of neurosis as an urgent mass problem. It is then that psychoanalysis will come into its own as a practical psychology particularly in the prophylaxis of neuroses. Today, there is a neutral zone, 15 kilometers in width between the Soviet Union on the one hand and Poland and Romania on the other. With the Romania, there are no railway communications whatever, and at the Polish frontier, we passed barbed wire entanglements and trenches. The Soviet Union is a besieged fortress, and those who hold this fortress are keeping a close check on all imports including scientific ideas. They want to know for certain what their country stands to gain or lose from a science which a part of the bourgeoisie regards as a new cultural philosophy. Only by bearing this in mind can we hope to understand the position of psychoanalysis in the Soviet Union.